brother Dan comes tonight. If you'll turn with me in Matthew to the 26th chapter. I just want to make a few comments on some scripture in here. Sometimes we <clears throat> read the Bible and we kind of glaze over things or gaze over them and uh, uh, don't really comprehend the rich meaning that's in there. Um, and we'll start reading here in just a second, the 35th, or 36th uh, verse of the 26th chapter. I want you to sit and think for just a moment before we read. And think of something that's happened in your life that was tragic. Something that was painful. You know, I've been in a few car wrecks and I've had some kidney stones and I think those things were painful. They lasted for a few days, some of them, and the hurt, to, you know... I still have residuals from some of those things, but I didn't know they were going to happen. When I had a car wreck, somebody hit me just like that, and bang, it happened. I didn't have time to prepare. And most of the time, when a kidney stone hits you, it's about the same way. Now, those are my experiences, and you may think of something that's happened in your life. But let's think about that pain, and now let's go back a few days or weeks before that and know that that's going to happen to you. And know that you're going to suffer. Let's read the scripture. Verse 36, it said, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He knew what was coming. Verse 38 says, Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, if you knew you were going to be in a car wreck, or if you knew that you were going to be hurt some way, you would probably try to talk your way out of it. And Jesus knew what he was facing. And he's asking God, he said, if it can be possible, I'd just soon not do this. He knew what he was going to face. He had that power. He's obvious, but all known. He knew what was going to happen. And I think that part of this, and I think Doc, Doc can bear me out, it was this stress that he was suffering and knowing and the condition I can't even pronounce, but that his blood got into his sweat glands because he knew what was going to happen. Now when it happens to us, it happens and we don't know, but it, what I'm trying to get across to you is to think about even what happened in his mind before it ever happened. He suffered greatly before it ever happened for us. Verse 40 says, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me an hour? Now you know something bad is going to happen to you, and maybe somebody goes to the hospital with you, but they're over here asleep, and you're sitting here worrying about it. How would that even compound the way that you felt? Because you took somebody with you for support, and they're over here cutting logs. And you're sitting there with us wrestling with this in your mind. He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We get tired. Our bodies get tired. He says, and he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them again, asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. You know, I sit and think about the Apostle Paul when he said, I asked him three times. And God told him, he said, my grace is sufficient. And this is what Jesus is learning here. He's, he knows God's saying to him, this is what's going to happen. It's not going to pass from him. This is what's going to happen. And all of this is happening in his mind, suffering, before he ever gets the first cut. 
where he ever gets the first slap or the spit in the face. Then cometh he to the disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is hand as at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Leading right up to that point, I think that sometimes it slips our mind how much Jesus suffered before he suffered. This time for the Dan Frank's message. Thanks, Brother Tom. I know we've said it before, but I couldn't listen to that. He, he has a way of making things plain and simple. Uh, I don't know if I've lost that someplace along the line. I'm going to sit this over here because the outline was knocked off. It's got, it says Jimmy on it. It's got your name on it. Okay. We've had a, we've had a real good week and and I know it's it's been a tiring week for a lot of people, and a lot of people are kind of worn out. And I was feeling that way myself for a while, and then I started thinking about what Jesus went through on that week. We didn't have a rough week. You know, he 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 went through it all. Uh, and Brother Tom did a real good job there bringing that out, and Doc did the other day the the things that he suffered and what he had gone through, and. Uh, I'm kind of, when Jimmy, I think brought it up Thursday, he talked about the keys to the kingdom. And I want to get into that some today. That was kind of what I had in mind. And, and I'm, I'm glad he brought it out because that's, that's really something that's important and it's something that all of us need to know. If we're already Christians and we've already done it, we still know how to, we need to know how to explain it to other people and tell other people about it. Uh, this morning I was looking at Old Testament uh, uh, predictions and, and what was going to happen and, and how that it did and that Jesus uh, was the you know he, he was the prediction that, that they had uh, foretold of and uh, how he fulfilled all the different uh, for, uh, all the different uh, predictions prophecies that's the word I've been looking for uh, and I'd like to go to Daniel chapter 2 today. <laughs> Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were captured. And they were brought to Babylon. And as, as Jews that, that worship the one true God, you know, things were a little difficult for them there, but but they did have the one true God for them, and that, that put them a step ahead of everybody else. In chapter 2 of Daniel, <coughs> excuse me, we read, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, we're told, God, who at sundry times... And in divers' manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by prophets. We see that here with, with Daniel. He's, he'll have a vision. And the same type of thing with Nebuchadnezzar here. He dreamed a dream and it was, it was something that was important. It wasn't something that Nebuchadnezzar could understand. As a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar forgot what he dreamed. Uh, but Daniel was able, with God's help, to tell him what it was all about. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now this is a king that was an idolater. You know, he didn't, he didn't believe in the one true God. So for him to call for magicians and sorcerers and astrologers was the natural thing to do. That's what people thought they were supposed to do. And that's what he did. And they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. He didn't remember what he dreamed. You know, we, we dream sometimes, and, and I, I really don't remember many of my dreams at all. But sometimes you start thinking about a dream, and, and a little bit of it comes back to you, and then you start remembering more and more of it. So when it starts coming back to you, 
you may gradually remember more and more of it. But here Nebuchadnezzar, he just he didn't even remember what he dreamed, but for some reason he thought it must be real important. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Now this would be the natural way to do it. You tell me what the dream is, and I'll tell you what it means. That's what they wanted to do. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut to pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Pretty strict, isn't he? That's a rough king, not one I'd want to live under. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Now, it seems like he's asking something just ridiculous that nobody could do. We find out that, that nobody can do this. But this is what he asked for. Verse 7 says, They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we shall show the interpretation thereof. Again, they said, Tell us what the dream is, and we can interpret it for you. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't remember what it was. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. Or you would try to buy extra time because you see that I don't, I don't remember what it is. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed, or until a later time. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. So now he's saying, if you can tell me what the dream is, and you're right about that, then I know the interpretation is going to be correct. But he still didn't remember what the dream was. And it is a rare thing. Excuse me, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. He said, Nobody would ever ask anybody to do this. How can you ask us? To tell you what the dream is and then interpret it. You have to tell us what the dream is. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose flesh, whose, whose dwelling is not with flesh. And the gods that they were talking about, I don't know if they were talking about the, the moon god or, or a, a piece of wood someplace that was sitting in a corner. None of them would have been flesh, and they, they believed that these gods could interpret these kind of things. And these gods may have been able to pull them, tell them what the, what the dream was, but no man on earth could do it. For this cause, the king was angry and very ferocious, furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He said, okay, put them all to death. He said he was going to cut them into pieces, and he was going to make their houses a dunghill. And he said, let's do that. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They were considered wise men. So they were sought to be slain also. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the king of the, or rather the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. This was what Arioch was supposed to do. He was supposed to find the wise men and, and put them to death. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty for, from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. So he explained what had happened. The Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he didn't even remember what it was, but he needed an interpretation for it. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. So he went to Arioch and he said, Hey, I can tell him what the interpretation is. Just, just give me some time. Then Daniel went to his... And, and the other people were asking for time too. The astrologers, astrologers and everybody was asking for time. But they said it was impossible to do. 
Daniel asked for time, but he said, I can do it. He was willing to, to tell what the dream was and the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And, and they're also known better to us probably as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what he asked him was that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So the first thing he did, he went to his three, his three fellows, as they're referred to here, companions, and he said, we need to pray. Basically, that's what he said, we need to pray. When we're faced with a difficult problem, what do we need to do first and foremost? We need to pray. But now we don't just pray and say, okay, I've, I've heard it referred to as name it, claim it. You know, you say the prayer so it's done, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. You say a prayer that, that you would uh, have a, a mansion up on a hill someplace, and it's yours. That's name and claim. That's not, not really scriptural. But we need to pray for things according to God's will, not something that we would consume upon our own lust. We're told that if we ask for that, and we don't receive it. But because that's that's something that we're wanting, not something that, that will help God or his kingdom. And that's what we need to be interested in. We need to ask for things according to God's will. Sometimes we may ask for something, and God may say, sure, and it's there. Other times we may ask for something, and God may say, not right now. It's not going to do you any good right now. But on down the road, it might. Other times we may pray for something, and God might say, now I've got something better in mind for you. But whatever we pray for, we need to pray according to God's word. And that's what Daniel was asking his companions to do here, to pray that they might understand this secret, this, this secret dream and the interpretation of it. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel was a prophet. He heard this through a night vision or, or a type of dream that he dreamed. He dreamed what the dream was and the interpretation thereof. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. Now what does he do? After he receives it, he gives God thanks. He goes back to praying. And he says, Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Wisdom and might are his. He has all wisdom and all might. He can do all things. And he changes the times and the seasons. He has, he has control over the weather, weather. He can change them when he wants to. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. And you can go to uh, first and second Samuel and first and second kings, and you can you can read how kings were set up and they were knocked down and they were set up over and over again. He giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, we're told, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. He reveals the things when we're ready for them. We have to have a certain amount of understanding, and we, we have to do our part when we pray, too. You know, you can pray for something and never do anything about it, and it's not going to happen. But if you pray for it and then work for it, that's when things happen. When we do our part, too. we got to do our part all the time. In salvation, we have to do our part. People want to say it's all God. We don't have anything to do with our own salvation. It's just God. All we have to do is have faith. We don't do anything. Of course, having faith is doing something. And actually, in... Uh, uh, one of the Gospels. <laughs> I can't remember where it's at. But in one of the Gospels, um, they asked Jesus, I think it's in John chapter 6, they asked Jesus, what must we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answering said unto them, this is a work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. It's a work of God to believe in Jesus Christ. Yet people say, believe, no works. Yet belief is the work of God according to Jesus. 
We need to do the works of God, the law of Christ. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to follow the law of Christ. In Hebrews 12, 7, it says that, uh, speaking of Melchizedek and, and that change over to Christ, it says in seeing we had a change in the priesthood, we also need a change in the law. So it wasn't that the law was just fixed out. There was a change in the law from the Old Testament to the New Testament, to the law of Christ that we need to continue to follow. And when God tells us we need to do something, that's a work of God. So when we believe, it's a work of God when we believe in Jesus Christ. In Jonah 3.10, we're told, And God saw the works that they had done, how they turned from their evil ways. When you turn from your evil ways, that is repentance. That is a work that they had done. They turned from their evil ways. So repentance is a work. So for people to, to, to say, you know, you, you believe, you confess, you repent, but, but baptism, now you're getting into works. You're, you've already done works. If you're following the scriptures and if you know what the Bible says. We're told we need to be baptized. It's something we need to do. Jesus Christ's part in this was to live a sin-free life. He had the hard part. There was no doubt about it. Live a sin-free life and then be crucified because of the sins we commit. God's part was to send His Son to allow that to happen and to raise Him from the dead. Our part is to do what the Bible says to do. And it's plain and simple, as Brother Joe mentioned last night. You know, it's, it's simple enough for anybody to understand. But you can't just be going to one verse. you got to look at what the Bible says as a whole. You can't pick and choose the things you want to do. Some people want to pick and choose what they do out of the Old Testament. And then they'll say, well, we don't sacrifice animals because that's in the Old Testament. We don't do that anymore because Christ died for us. Yet they want to go back to the Old Testament and say why they do this or this or this. Because the Old Testament tells us to. I can remember where I'm at here. He's, he's at. Verse. Where am I? 22? 22? Okay, 22. 23 then. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee? For thou hast made known, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So again, he gives God the thanks. Therefore, Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Now notice, when uh, he first talked to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he told them to pray that, that they wouldn't perish with the rest of the wise men. But now that he has the interpretation, he says, Hey, don't let any of them perish. He didn't want that to happen. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Well, the king already knew Daniel. The king already knew how wise Daniel was. Back in chapter 1, uh, Verses 19 and 20, it says, And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So he already knew that Daniel had much greater wisdom than the astrologers that he called to interpret the dream in the first place. 
Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men and astrologers and magicians and soothsayers show unto the king. Daniel said, matter of factly, they're not able to do it. They know they can't do it. Well, who could? They even said nobody could do it, didn't they? No man could do it. But Daniel says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Daniel's not coming in saying, I can do it. He's coming in saying, there's a God in heaven that can do it. And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon the bed. What should come to pass hereafter, and what that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee, what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. For the sakes of those, uh, for Daniel and others, and for the king himself, uh, that the interpretation would be made known, but also that the king might know the thoughts of his heart. I, I looked this verse up in in, uh, in another version. I looked it up in several, and, and all the others seemed to be a little bit clearer to me. Uh, the New Century Version uh, made it real simple. God also told this secret to me, not because I have greater wisdom than any other living person, but so that ye might know what it means, in that way, you will understand what went through your mind. So we see it was it was for the king. It was so that he would understand and know what it was that he dreamed and what the interpretation was. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. Now this great image, uh, image would be a, a figure, an idolatrous figure, which would fit right in with, with King Nebuchadnezzar's beliefs. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible, or it was great, or it was tremendous. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, and we'll learn later that that stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. So this rock was cut out of the mountain without hands and it hits this large statue in the feet and breaks the feet to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floor. It became like shaft of a threshing floor. The threshing floor where you got the wheat, what they would do is they would they would take a shovel and they would take the wheat and they'd throw it into just a different pile. And when they threw it, the chaff would be caught by the air and it would fall to the floor. That's how, how this was. It was like dust. And that's what this turned into. And the wind carried them away because it was like dust. That no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The stone that smote the image grew, and it grew tremendously. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Actually, King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon was the head of gold. There were, from, from the day Daniel to the coming of Christ, the world has been ruled by four great empires. The first being that of Babylon. And this is, this is world rulers. Since this time, nobody has ever ruled the world there have been some countries that have tried to come up short. But these countries, or these kingdoms, ruled the whole world. First the Babylonian Empire, then Persian. Third was the 
uh, Macedonian Empire or the Greek Empire, and the fourth was the Roman Empire. They all ruled the world. And that's exactly as Daniel predicts here, or as the, the interpretation of this dream predicts. Verse 39 says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. After Babylon, after it's gone, after it falls, there will be another kingdom inferior. That would be the kingdom of Persia. And, an, and another third kingdom of brass. And that would be the Greek kingdom or the uh, Macedonian kingdom. Which shall bear rule over all the earth. That's what they had in common. They bore rule over the entire earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And the Roman kingdom was divided into two separate elements. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now, the government in Rome was broken down into ten different uh, parts of the government. Ten different governmental units. In verse 30, or rather 42 says, And the toes of the feet, how many toes on the feet? Been ten toes. The same as what was in Rome at the time. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken or partly brittle or fragile. They were fragile because they had the clay mixed in with them. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They mingled themselves with the seed of, seed of men. They, they started doing things according to man's thoughts, rather than looking toward God. You know, we, we pray in here fairly often, several lead prayer. I've said it and I've heard others pray it, that the leaders of our countries would look toward God for answers to difficult questions that they have. We, we make that prayer because that's what they didn't do here. They, they didn't follow the Lord. But they were told in uh, Proverbs 16.25, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what they were doing. They were looking towards man's ways and not looking towards God's ways anymore. And then the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In the days of these kings, now this is, it, it could refer to the kings of the four different kingdoms, but more likely it refers to the ten kings over the ten uh, governmental units within Rome. During that time, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Listen to what this kingdom is. Now this is during the time of Rome that this kingdom would have been set up. Which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now if that kingdom stands forever, it would still be here today. It would have been set up during the time of Roman rule. And it would still be here today because it stands forever. Even after this world is destroyed, the kingdom will continue. You know, we're told in uh, Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In Matthew 16.18, where, where Brother Jimmy read from the other day, and, and I'll start, uh, I'll, I'll try to read through these fairly quick. Verse uh, 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus said he would build his church upon this rock. That rock was not Peter. 
But it was what Peter said. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock or the firm foundation upon which the church is built. And it's Jesus' church. It's on that firm foundation. The very fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's going to be an, intern, an eternal kingdom. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven or the church. They're one and the same. In, I've already mentioned in Colossians, but also in, uh, I think, verse 9 of chapter 1 in Revelation, John said he was in the kingdom when he was writing uh, the book of Revelation. He was in the kingdom on the Lord's day. So we see that, that the kingdom was in existence at that time. The kingdom that Daniel told us about from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That very same kingdom. There are certain things we need to do to enter into that kingdom. Jimmy went through them the other day. You need to hear the word, believe, repent, confess the Lord whom God had sent, be immersed and enter in, and continue faithful till the end. We need to do each and every one of those things. The kingdom, you know, back in, uh, in Daniel there, it, it said that that the the mountain after after the the image was broken down, the mountain would grow and it would be a mountain that would fill the whole world. Remember, Jesus told us a parable about the kingdom. He said the kingdom is like a little mustard seed, it's just one of the tiniest things there is. And that mustard seed would grow and be a tree that, that the birds could land in. That's what God's kingdom is. And we need to do our part in, in helping to enlarge God's kingdom. Every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the kingdom increases. The kingdom continues to grow. Like that mountain that encases the whole world. And there are people throughout the world and have been throughout the world for years, thousands of years, that have given their life to Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom that Daniel told us. That's the kingdom that we need to be a member of. If you're not a Christian today and you'd like to give your life to Christ, you've heard the word, you need to believe, you need to repent. Or ask the Lord to come into your life and help you start living for Him and get out of your old life. Then during our song of invitation, we invite you to come forward. And there's a couple more things you got to do to become a member of His kingdom. You need to confess Him before man. We'll give you that opportunity right here tonight. And you need to be baptized for remission of sins, and we'll give you that opportunity as well. And you can be a Christian before you walk out the door tonight. Or you can put it off. Maybe a more convenient time will come your way. Maybe not. We don't know, because we don't know when our last breath will be. We don't know if we're going to make it home tonight. Some of us live pretty close, but we, we can't guarantee that. We have plans on going home from here, and I hope and pray everybody makes it home. But it, it's not something that we can guarantee. It's what God wills. This time, let us stand and sing number 629.